Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about Anglo-Saxon shrines. Yeah, I've already done a video in which I suggested that before the conversion to Christianity there may have been boundary shrines on hilltops. But in this video, there's much less speculation. We know these were shrines because of the words used in their names. But they weren't on hilltops. Just the opposite. They were in valleys. Specifically, at fords. So I'm going to look at several places called Weeford, and one called Wyfordby, and several places all called Stapleford. Yeah, you heard me right. Stapleford, not Stapleford. Even though the Ordnance Survey has them all down as Staplefords. We're talking about Anglo-Saxon shrines, not a ubiquitous way of holding sheets of paper together. Back in the 1980s, the Stapleford in Leicestershire was pronounced by the locals as Stapleford. But of course, people move into an area, they look at the written form of the word and guess at the pronunciation. So within a few years, almost everyone's calling them Staplefords. And we even got to explain why Christian Malford in Wiltshire started out as something similar. So... There's two Old English words which are key to understanding these place names. One is Swio, also spelt W-I-G, but then pronounced like Y. For simplicity, I'm just used Wio. Wio, or Y, is found in settlement names such as Weeford, Wyfordby, Wheely, and Wiley. And these tell us where a Wio once stood by a ford, or in a woodland clearing, or Lee. In addition, there are several villages in Northamptonshire associated with Weedon. So it's the rounded hill, the Don, on which there was a Weo. And there's also several Weo Dons which don't have settlements, and the one I know best is, is Wayton Hill, next to Avebury. Linguists tell us very confidently that Weo denotes both a shrine and an idol. And this isn't as confusing as it first seems. Think of any number of roadside shrines in Catholic countries where there's a small statue of the Virgin Mary or a locally venerated saint. The words shrine and statue are almost synonymous in this context. And, as John Wycliffe and other late medieval lollards zealously preached, venerating such statues should be thought of as idolatry. Indeed, wayside Catholic shrines could be thought of as a direct continuation of Wios, although the appearance may well have changed greatly over the centuries. If you think this is taking an analogy too far, in Beowulf there is mention of Wai Wir Fung, which means worshipping of idols. And when the pagan priest Koifi destroys his own temple, Bede specifically states that both the building and the Wai bed, literally the idol table, but presumably a wooden altar, went up in the flames. We can only presume that the Y-bed was carved and perhaps covered in elaborately decorated textiles. The omits to mention the Y or Wio which stood on the Y-bed, but this too was presumably wooden. If we look at the cognate word in Greek, Y-icon, um, this too describes an icon or powerful devotional image, or at least it did initially. In classical Greece, the icon shifts meaning to denote statues of people, while the word agalma is introduced for statues of deities. Then there's a third word, zuanon, which denotes a portable icon. Words, of course, shift meaning, and the later sense of icon to denote a statue of a person doesn't diminish the shared origin with weo. So the ancient Greeks clearly felt the need to distinguish three different types of devotional image, depending on both what was depicted and how the image was used, whether it was portable or too big to be moved. So we shouldn't be surprised that the Anglo-Saxons made a distinction between weos and staples, even though we can't be sure what that distinction was. The general understanding is that staples were carved from wood and larger than weos. So, can we drill into Stapol a bit more? Well, linguists inform us that after the conversion to Christianity, the word Stapol is used quite often to refer to something with its feet in the ground, most typically to describe what we would call the foundations of buildings. So, before the conversion, it seems reasonable to think that Stapols were too heavy to be easily transported and were, shall we say, planted into the ground. Um, perhaps these large wooden carvings were akin to North American totem poles. 
The nearest we may have to a wooden stapple is a limestone pillar recovered from the river Zibrzda um, in southern Poland, which is thought to be an idol erected by the followers of the Slavic cult of Sovantovit. Because this isn't from Northern Europe, still less than the British Isles, it probably was never thought of as a stapple because in the local languages it's a bow one. But in contrast to stapples, wheels seem light enough to have been carried by a small number of people, perhaps even just one person, in a manner akin to medieval statues of saints. Whether they were often moved around is a moot point, but this distinction may have been based on principle rather than practice. Not all weos at Fords became known as Wyford. Why in Kent is on the eastern bank of the Great Store River, but in that town the Pilgrim's Way crosses a Roman road. Presumably the eponymous weo or why was at the crossroads rather than the ford. At least some weos seem to have had some sort of relationship with boundaries. The clearest example is now called Wyville, and it's just to the east of the former Roman road, which still marks the Leicestershire-Lincolnshire boundary. A document of 1185 describes this as wife well, um, as in the sense of the wives' wells. Um, it's presumably actually a corruption of Wea Wella, the shrine wells. Two springs still feed into pools at the bottom of a steep hill, and on top of that hill, in the 19th century, a church was built. Miranda Oldhouse Green once wrote that Iron Age cult statues were not passive objects for contemplation, as if they were works of art in a gallery or museum, but dynamic tools used by the communities which produced and consumed them. I see no reason why Anglo-Saxon weos and staples were any different from their Iron Age precursors in this respect, even though the local meanings and significances of these dynamic tools would have continually changed. While there are no surviving examples of weos from England, we do have a good idea of what such carvings might have been like in Denmark. They could have ranged from carvings as skilled as the prows of Viking longboats to the crude anthropomorphic and ithyphallic tree branches found in bogs. Can we be more specific about weos? Were they necessarily carved wooden idols? Could some of them have been more akin to corn dollars? And bear in mind the word doll is a contraction of idle. And yet others may have been uncarved standing stones, as we have a letter written by Bishop Oldheim in the 680s, which refers in Latin to Ermilla cruda. This has the literal meaning of crude little herm, and suggests a pillar which was phallic in nature. But then as now, the word crude had two senses. So was Old Helm thinking of carvings resembling the classical statues depicting the faces and genitals of deities such as Hermes or Priapus? Or was he simply referring to uncarved standing stones as crude pillars? Old Helm's remarks say nothing about whether the Ermilla were in wood or stone, so he could have referred to an idol akin to the Danish examples or to an uncarved standing stone. And just to add a little complexity, there's the Old English word leek, which has the sense of potency. And yes, leek, the vegetable, is cognate with this, um, because leeks have a potent smell. Now, there were numerous leek stands, which translates as the stone of potency, and these were all associated with the inauguration of kings. Um, read into that what you, uh, you will, but that's leek stands. To what extent were wheels and staples regarded as having leak? And the honest answer is who knows. But no doubt Old Helm would have had a clear understanding of whether or not they fell within the scope of his Ermilla Cruda. If Old Helm's remark includes wooden as well as stone Ermillas, then we need to bear in mind that wood, unlike stone, was regarded by Anglo Saxons as a living material. So the idea of wooden weos and staples being potent masculine symbols is at the very least plausible. Of course, Old Hay may have been using the term herm to refer less to the appearance than to the function. The Greeks and Romans set up herms as boundary markers and then venerated them as guardians. 
So, old Helm may have been using the term omula cruda to refer to small, uncarved, although possibly still somewhat phallic, boundary stones. The implication is that they were still being venerated here in Britain. And we kind of know that the cult of Tutatis, whose name means tribal protector, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries is associated with tribal boundaries. OK, well, let's leave that for the moment. Let's look at more at Staples. Four settlements in England as known as Stapleford, one's in Cambridgeshire, one's in Leicestershire, one's in Nottinghamshire, and the other's in Lincolnshire. There's also a Stapleton or Stapleton in Wiltshire, and in Bedfordshire there's Dunstable, the Stapple on the Dune, or the Heath. And this crossroads with a marker post predates the town, it predates the medieval priory, um, which uh, then led to a town developing around it. There was also a hundred of administrative hundred in Kent, which met at a Thurstapel, the Stapel dedicated to the god Thor or Thunor. And in Essex there's both a Thurstapel, Thunor Stapel, and a Barstapel, the bearded one Stapel. And we also know that a Stapel was a significant part of a royal hall, as in the poem Beowulf, Hrothga stood on a Stapel to inspect Grendel's arm. This might make Stapples relatives of the pair of high-seat pillars known from the various Scandinavian sagas which recount the pioneering settlement of Iceland. Possible parallels between such high-seat pillars and Anglo-Saxon Stapples are suggested by just two brief remarks in Icelandic literature. One saga says that such a pillar was carved with an image of the god Thor, and a different saga says that high-seat pillars had god nails or power nails in them. But these two remarks are the nearest we have to descriptions of these high seat pillars. Just possibly a doorway illustrated on the Bayo Tapestry as a descendant of this tradition. We can reasonably assume that god nails were iron nails, as at the time this was regarded as the most magical of metals. There was probably one such spike at the top of each pillar, representing the pole star, which was known to the Scandinavian people of this time as the nail. And so each pillar was like an axis mundi, or close kin of the world tree. Indeed, in other Scandinavian sagas, there's the mention of the gold topper, literally the gold topper, a golden spike at the top of the world tree, elsewhere named as Heimdallar. <clears throat> but only one pillar is needed to symbolise the axis mundi, whereas the paired pillars of Icelandic sagas are something of an elaboration. Um, but then... Perhaps the stapel on which Hrothgar stood in Beowulf was also one of a bear. At the royal site of Yevering in Northumberland, a large wooden post had been erected in the top of a burial mound near the hall, seemingly a stapel. In the absence of other evidence, this may have been the focal point of outdoor observances, although there probably were shrine figures in one or more of the buildings. Were stapels once as big as some of the permanent maypoles still surviving in England? Here's the ones at uh, Barwick in Elmet, Yorkshire, Belton in Leicestershire, and Limby and Wellow, both in Nottinghamshire. However, unlike uh, such modern maypoles, most or all stapoles were carved, although how they might have been carved is open to debate. In the churchyard at Stapleford in Nottinghamshire, there is a substantial fragment of an Anglo-Saxon stone cross, said to date from about the year 700 AD. Was this a successor to, or even the final manifestation, of the eponymous Stapol? Bear in mind the decoration isn't explicitly Christian. Now, if you're thinking that seeing the stone cross at Stapleford as the successor to a pre-conversion Stapol is a bit too radical, well, think of the Wiltshire village of Christian Malford. This derives its name from the ford with a Christ Mal. Mal means mark or marker, and it's the origin of the modern word mole to describe a large, freckle-like mark on the skin. Christ moles may have been little more than a cross cut into turf or cut into the bark of a tree. Significantly, Christian Malford Church is not in the centre of the village. Instead, it's right by the banks of the River Avon at a place which would have been ideally suited to fording, even if you accept that the modern river channel has been deepened and widened to minimise flooding. The road now crosses the River Avon over a bridge a few hundred yards away, but a place where the river was narrower and therefore more suitable to building a bridge.
when taking this photograph, if I'd actually stepped back another couple of yards or so, I'd have actually fallen into the river. It's right behind me. So the Christ Mal Fort in Wiltshire seems to be a direct Christian counterpart to the various Staplefords, but offering similar supernatural protection at what might have been a tricky place to cross the watercourse. Now, intriguingly, the church at Stapleford in Lincolnshire is just like Christian Malford, also by the side of the river. This is the River Witham, and so it's remote from the village. The River Witham now runs in a deep channel and there's a concrete bridge to provide access for farm vehicles. But formerly, the river would have been wider and shallower, with sloping banks associated with fords. And I think almost certainly this Lincolnshire church occupies the site of the eponymous Starpole. So, as I mentioned before, in the Anglo-Saxon worldview, wood was a living material which was integral to everyday life. It was capable of being shaped and joined together so you could build houses, make tools and utensils. In contrast, stone was seen as inert and recalcitrant. The ruins of Roman buildings built from stone were deemed to be the work of giants. So the shift from wooden carvings, such as weos and staples, to carved stone crosses was not simply a shift of medium. The message was shifting somewhat too. Specifically, the message is more biblical, alluding to Old Testament passage which refer to a Bethel, which initially meant stone of God, quite likely some sort of standing stone, but evolved to mean house of God, in other words, a stone-built temple. As the medieval era unfolded, fords were protected by what we now want to call a bridge chapel, and indeed the income from donations to such chapels may well have paid for the ford to be replaced by a causeway or bridge. But that's all for another video.